Okay. <laughs> Testing one, two. Going live, going live. We go live. Okay. Testing one, two. And YouTube. Ah. Yes. <laughs> Live stream. Right, but it's not coming up yet. It's there. Okay, so we good? Testing one, two, one, two, three. Live stream and YouTube. Testing one, two, three. The link is working. Test, test, one, two, three. So we good? Okay. Is it what? Oh, okay. <laughs> Is it because we're going through live stream? YouTube. Okay. Yes, still alive. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. So we'll leave this alone. This I can cut it. Okay. So this
que pedir esto al principio. Creo que esta agua está limpia para ti. Gracias. Ya había tomado, ya lo había cambiado el vaso. Ok. Este estaba acá. Ya no es ninguno. Entonces ese es mío porque yo le metí. Entonces este es tuyo. Perfecto. Good evening everyone. Um, we're going to start. Uh, so welcome, first of all, to our first panel of our series of public programs. This one is in discussion, Ulises Carrion, Art, Mail, Books, and So. So this program is also organized in collaboration with the Institute for Studies on Latin American Art, ISLA, on occasion of the exhibition Ulises Carrion, The Big Monster, that is currently uh, held at ISLA. Uh, my name is Carolina Scarborough. I'm the assistant curator for public programs at America Society. And I, first I wanted to let everybody know that the program is being um, streamed live. So for anybody that wants to, you can go into our social media to the link. Uh, and I want to also thank our speakers for being here. Uh, it's really great to have you. And I also want to thank Jaime Iglesias Luking, <laughs> our director and chief curator, and my colleague Diana Flato for their ongoing support. And I would also like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to our upcoming programs. Uh, this coming Thursday, March 5th, we will have our second panel of our series in discussion. Uh, it's I Am Reborn at Every Moment, Contemporary Reflections on Feliciano Centurion and AIDS. And this includes speakers Bill Arning, artist Electra Cabe, KB and Carlos Mota, and it's going to be moderated by Gonzalo Casals. On Saturday, March 7th, we're delighted to have Jacopo Crivelli Visconti. He's the curator of the 34th Biennale of Sao Paulo uh, that is going to be opening in September. S and this panel is going to be organized in collaboration with International Cur uh, Independent Curators International. And on March 12th, we will be 
presenting for the first time our performance series. So we'll start with the performance by Anna Massé and Regina uh, Parra uh, titled Ophelia. Uh, you can check into our website. We have all the details and information about these programs, but we'd love to have you here. And without further ado, let me present our speakers. Uh, Felipe Becerra, who's the Department of Latin American and Iberian Cultures at Columbia University. Monica de la Torre, the Madeleine Leventhal Rand Endowment the Chair in Literature from Brooklyn College, uh, Zana Gilbert. She's the Senior Research Specialist at the Getty Research Institute. And our moderator, Jaime Iglesias Luque, who in addition to being our Director and Chief Curator of Visual Arts, she's also the Curator of Ulises Carrion, the Big Monster. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you, Carol. Can you hear me? Okay, so um, a little bit, I just wanted to, I'm going to be a moderator only, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the exhibition and about ISLA, ISLA is the Institute, the Institute for Studies on Latin American Art, and they've been uh, for almost a decade promoting uh, academic initiatives related to Latin American art in the United States. Uh, they have supported important publications, but also uh, for years the public uh, programs related to Latin American art at uh, Columbia and NYU, and an initiative of uh, conferences organized by graduate students in collaboration with CUNY, and many other things. Um, but uh, so uh, this is also to explain not only uh, the history of our partner for this event, but also to explain a little bit about the history of this exhibition. Um, I was invited to create this exhibition before I took office here at the America Society. Um, the show opened in October last year, and this is the first exhibition that ISLA is doing. Um, besides doing all these um, talks on initiatives that I mentioned, they've been collecting archives related to Latin American art, and they have a very important collection that is available for consultation of uh, researchers. And they are trying also to save, uh, as many of you might know, if you are into arts or academia, um, artist archives are an invaluable um, element of study for us. And they've been taking care of uh, saving it, collecting it, and making it accessible. Uh, when uh, Isla invited me to do an exhibition in their new space. Uh, the idea was to do something related to their mission, to you know, academic initiatives, but also archives collecting. And Ulises Carrion was a natural choice uh, because he is an artist uh, where, whose practice is very much comprised and constituted by the archive itself. I'm going to show you a few uh, images of the show for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to see it. If you have not, you can check the website of ISLA and you can um, see the show uh, by appointment. But this is uh, their space. Um, and the show is called uh, The Big Monster because uh, that is the name of a selection of male artworks that Ulysses Carrion did. For those of you who don't know about Carrion, he was a polyphasetic um, artist, writer, uh, cultural agent, originally from Mexico, who uh, moved to Europe to study and ended up uh, settling in Amsterdam, where he uh, created um, community spaces and bookstores and art galleries, uh, two especially, but the most famous one was Other Books and So. Uh, as part of his practice, this is only one side of his practice, male art, and this is what the show is focused on. Uh, he um, created, he was the key figure of the international male art movement that started in the 1970s. Um, a pioneer and also a key figure of it. Uh, and uh, what we are showing on the exhibition are 10 projects, as I said, organized around the idea of the big monster, which is the concept that he develops when he starts questioning the limitations of male art. He does a classification and a history of male art just a few years after the movement started, and he uh, classifies the movement and, and male art uh, 
as a practice according to the type of recipients, the amount and type of interventions that it would have on the system. And his main goal, I'm trying to be as synthetic as possible so I can let our speakers uh, talk, but follow me <laughs> and forgive my uh, briefness, but just to pique your interest at least in case you don't know about this. Um, what he is trying to propose is an idea of male art that is not so much about uh, art that is male on itself, but, an, but uh, more broadly, an idea of art that intervenes the system of male itself and the way that we uh, transport pieces and the idea of the, the male system. He reaches a limit on his classification and his study of male art, which he calls the, male, the big monster uh, which is uh, the male system. And he develops an alternative male system that Sana is gonna discuss a little bit on her presentation, so I won't expand on that, but it's the Amis. But that is the idea of the big monster uh, that you saw in the title of this panel and the title of the exhibition. The limit of uh, the state sponsor or private sponsor male system that we use in male art to uh, share artworks. So just a few images, as I said, uh, the show is comprised of 10 key male art projects that he developed during the 1970s and 80s. Um, and I hope that you have a chance to see the exhibition. The space is lovely. This is on 78th and Madison, and you can contact the the space uh, on their website and arrange for a visit by appointment. There's also some open days and we're doing some curatorial uh, tours and I hope you can come. And with that, I am gonna pass to our first guest, Monica. Hi everybody, is this audible? Yes, okay. Um, so I, I, I'm very happy to be here for numerous reasons. Thank you, Aimee, for inviting me. Thank you for that beautiful exhibition. It's, a, it's really, really astounding. Um, I love how discreet the projects are and how easy it is to actually zero in on all the subtleties, right? Because it's not one, it's like all the different manifestations of one idea are absolutely beautiful in the show. Uh, what's really special to me is that I did research on Ulises Carrion for a doctoral dissertation many years ago and uh, I, really didn't belong in any, in, there was no community that could discuss Ulises Carrion's work uh, with me because his work was quite unknown. And uh, it seems like every year there's new um, angles on the work, new um, publications coming out. And uh, this is really enriching a dialogue that I hope uh, is very productive. So I wanna talk about the work of his that led to what everybody knows about him, which is the foundation of other books and so in Amsterdam in 1975, and the male art projects. Um, he, before he actually became an artist, a visual artist circulating in the visual art world uh, and lived in Amsterdam, he was actually a quite established writer in Mexico City. Um, but I realized that if I go off script, then I will be off script and it will be really hard to go into script, so I will start reading now. <laughs> but just, just to frame what I'm about to read, um, it is about some of the publications that he put forth in 1972 that um, posit the uh, development of the works, the open-ended works that will follow and you will see and others, my colleagues here will present on later. So, Carrion's practice owes much to appropriation, although the brand he performs always acknowledges the sources of the materials he intervenes, partly because his projects enact a sequential elimination of literary elements from a text. The initial presence of literary markers is crucial to its latter development, to its latter removal, that is, and Carrion's operations could be thought of as step-by-step -step demonstrations on how to turn an authored utterance into one positing new conditions of reception. As we shall see, once subjectivity and the literary has been methodically eradicated from Carrion's open-ended works, readers are invited to activate and continue the remaining texts as they please. First, 
before we talk about the spe specific pu publications, I would like us to consider the seminal 1975 manifesto, The New Art of Making Books, in which Carrion contrasts traditional books with book works, that's his word, or artist books positing a new relationship to the book's materiality and embodying a new approach to production. I quote, a book may be the accidental container of a text, the structure of which is irrelevant to the book. These are the books of bookshops and libraries. A book can also exist as an autonomous and self-sufficient form, including perhaps a text that emphasizes that form, a text that is an organic part of that form. Here begins the new art of making books, end of quote. For Carrion, the book, the book artist is not an author who writes a text that will be laid out by others, the artisans, the workers, the others, in a lesser position within the production hierarchy, but rather someone who makes books and assumes the responsibility for the whole process. The whole process is involved in, in the whole process, pardon me, involved, involves not only the making of books, but also their distribution and promotion, so to speak. For as we know, he developed a multidisciplinary practice that was based on words, certainly, but taken as further away from the, for him, confining realm of literature as possible and that hinged on his active participation within and his fostering of a community of like-minded practitioners. In a characteristically anti-literary text from 1980, reflecting on the 1975 manifesto, The New Art of Making Books, he writes, printed words are imprisoned in the matter of a book. This sounds better in Spanish, where printed is impreso, and imprisoned is preso. I do not regret that loss in translation. Playing upon words is a typical lyrical device, and therefore I reject it. Carrion had not always been averse to literature and traditional, traditional literary institutions, however. In Mexico City, he had studied literature at UNAM and had been involved with highly regarded literary circles. In the early 1960s, he received a grant from the Centro Mexicano de Escritores, which is an official organism, or it was really, certainly. Later, he published two short story collections that attained some notoriety, La Muerte de Miss O with the prestigious Editorial Era in 1966 and De Alemania with the equally reputable press Joaquin Mortiz in 1970. Carrion's stories cannot be said to foreshadow their author's latter stance against literature, although their narrators and protagonists displayed dissatisfaction with and a stilted relationship to language. It is never a vehicle for interiority, as well as a characteristic and rather small-minded ennui and frustration with Mexico. So after spending study periods in France, at the Sorbonne, Germany, and England, Carrion moved to Amsterdam in 1972. Christoph Scherix, curator of the 2009 exhibition In and Out of Amsterdam, Travels and Conceptual Art at the Museum of Modern Art, explains the city's appeal in the catalog essay. Quote, in the 1960s and 70s, Artists came here, Amsterdam, from all over the world, attracted by innovative museums, an up-and-coming gallery scene, progressive sociopolitical policies, and by the city itself, whose history had been shaped by progressive waves of both emigration and immigration." End of quote. Cherik cites a local curator who mentions the relevance of the In and Out Center, which had been founded by Colombian artist Raúl Marroquín which in the two years of its existence developed into a meeting place for artists interested in conceptual performance and body art, all art forms that Carrion eventually would engage in. So another collective Carrion had become associated with was the England-based press Beaugest. Founded, founded in 1971 by a group of artists and writers including Mexican artist Felipe Ehrenberg and his spouse Marta Leon, Bogest was devoted to exploring do-it-yourself printing technologies such as mimeograph machines, offset printing, and saddle stitching in order to publish visual and neo-dataist poetry, conceptual books, concrete poetry, and fluxus works. The conditions that led to the press's foundation are emblematic of the nuanced ways in which those seeking alternatives to the production modes of official culture were articulating a practice at the intersection of politics, new technologies, and formal experimentation. Um, Felipe Ehrenberg presented a paper, La Editorial como Proyecto Artístico, uh, the, the, the press as, a, as an artistic project, um, at the conference Conceptualismos du Sur in Sao Paulo in 2008, and he discusses the press's origins in the aftermath of Mexico's 1968 student movement and 
the massacre of Tlatelolco. I quote Edinburgh. Given the government's muzzle on printing presses, the basis turned to the mimeograph to circulate all kinds of slogans, denunciations, and dates for mobilizations. The flyers and bulletins attesting to their demands were expressed in images created by artists. The graphic works of 1968 are an entire imaginary of emergency. Their dynamism is surprising, end of quote. Yet having a mimeograph in one's possession was seditious enough to the authorities. Ehrenberg mentions that a close friend of his in Mexico City was sentenced to 14 years in prison for transporting one in her car. Ehrenberg and his family fled Mexico's political climate for London at first, where he was offered a guest editor mimeograph at a bargain price. Eventually, in 1970, along with David Mayer and Chris Welch, he and Elion founded Beaugest, with Jess standing for the guest editor in Devon, England. His co-editors had affiliations with Fluxus artists, and thus Beaugest titles would prove indicative of a number of attitudes distinctive of counter-cultural productions of the time. An anti-art ethos, artisanal production values, collaborative modes of production stemming from and reinforcing deteriorated social networks, and a palpable euphoria at the ability to cheaply reproduce and disseminate unconventional works bypassing traditional distribution channels. Although uninterested in developing a practice that would directly give voice to political concerns, Ulysses Carrion's first artist book, Sonnets from 1972, appeared in Amsterdam, and Beaugest Press published his second, Arguments, 1973. Carrion's interest in the double nature of the verbal sign as both conceptual and visual signifier, as well as his non-hierarchical approach to book production and authorship is manifest in both of these works. So first we're gonna look at sonnets. Um, and so here, what he does is he, he borrows a sonnet by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The, the sonnet is called Heart's Compass. And, and subsequently performs 44 interventions on it. So you could say that he, um, to a degree, distorts the text even though he does this progressively. Um, it doesn't matter if you can see it or not. I would declaim the poem, but it might not be necessary at this point for interest time. So here we have the sonnet, and its title announces what it is. Borrowed sonnet. Another variation. Capital sonnet. It's all in capital letters. Underlined sonnet. All underlined. Parenthetical sonnet. In parentheses. <laughs> Quoted sonnet. In quotes. Question sonnet, question mark at the end. Cautious sonnet. This one's a little trickier because you really have to find what's cautious about it. And it's the word meaning in quotes. <laughs> Hispanicized sonnet. There's a translation here. So you go by, you go from ye yeah in the second line of the second line of the second stanza to C. Si. It's the mark of Hispanization of the sonnet. There's a Germanized one. There's an alphabetical sonnet. This is all in alphabetical order. Mirrored sonnet, a mirror image of the original sonnet. So you start reading this book and you go, okay, I get the logic. Maybe there's gonna be a minuscule sonnet, right? It's, it's all gonna be in small caps or something. But then he starts playing around with it to the point that the sonnet becomes completely unrecognizable. This is a vertical sonnet, so it's all simply written vertically. And by this, by this point, we realize that the sonnet is becoming an image of a sonnet. Or is a sonnet simply because it's been designated as a sonnet but doesn't really look like a sonnet. But it, does, it, it really interferes with the reading process and begs to be seen as an image. Here we have an explicit sonnet in which if there was any ambiguity about who the love god was, Ulysses Carrion tells, that, tells us that it's Cupid. <laughs> we have an annotated sonnet, which I find particularly cl clever because the annotation consists of defining the word cloud, <laughs> which of course a cloud is hazy and nebulous by its, very, by its very existence. And so to define a cloud and clarify a cloud is particularly clever. It tells us that clouds are visible, condensed, watery vapor f floating high above general level of ground. 
This one is particularly interesting too. It's an exhaustive sonnet. And here he provides us with multiple synonyms for the word meaning in the sonnet. So, but as the meaning, and then he annotates, sense, significance, signification, import, point, tenor, purport, drift, bearing, pith, me, essence, spirit, implication, denotation, suggestion, nuance, allusion, acceptation, interpretation, connotation, hidden meaning, arrière pensée, substance, effect, burden, gist, sum and substance, argument, content, matter, text, subject matter, subject of all things that are. And he does a brilliant job uh, certainly making meaning as opaque as possible. Um, and so, yes, um, that, those are the ones I have for you. But there are others in which he treats the image as, a, as, a, as an artwork and has instructions. It says this side up and this side down, and then it's just, it's just morphing in that way. This next one is um, this book from 1972. It's called Poesias. Um, it was not published while he was alive. Um, it was going to be published in Mexico City before... He, he had already relocated to Amsterdam, but he had not founded other books and so. And he was in conversation with Octavio Paz, who was going to publish a selection of these poesias uh, in his magazine called Plural. And it gave rise to very interesting correspondence between Paz and Ulises Carrion, in which he talks about his interest in semiotics, but not from a linguistic point of view. What he does in this book is similar to what he does in sonnets, but he does it with Spanish. So he takes canonical Spanish texts. This is a poem by Juan de la Encina, Montesinera la Garza, and I will read it to you because I think it enacts, and it enacts one of the things that um, then lead to the section. The, the, the book is divided in sections. This one is called Ritmos, which means rhythms, and uh, I will make explicit what he's doing as soon as I read it to you. Montesina era la garza de muy alto volar, no hay quien la pueda tomar. Muy cuidoso pensamiento ha seguido su guarida, mas cuanto más es seguida, tiende, tiene más defendimiento. De seguirla soy contento, por de su vista gozar, no hay quien la pueda tomar. So those who understand, understand the Spanish. But those who don't are able to really focus on the rhythm of these, of these lines. What he does in the variations that he then proposes, and there's six of them, is to break down the rhythm only and substitute the syllables of the sonnet for ta. So in Spanish, when you carry a tune, you can go da 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 And you could spell that as ta, which is what he does. So here he has a, a, a calc of the sonic patterning of the original. da 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 And it matches the original. But then he starts subverting it. And he does so in a way that defies the logic of Spanish. You cannot have five stresses, not even more than one stress in a word. And the first line here is completely impossible in Spanish. Da, 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 etc. He does it to the point of absurdity the poem is reduced, even the sound disappears, it becomes hyphenated. And then at the end, you end up with four little particles that allow the reader to possibly uh, substitute these syllables for possible words in Spanish and to distort this poem even further. Uh, I'm going to show you, in the interest of time, one more example of what he does here. Uh, this other section of the book is called Graficas. And he takes another Spanish canonical poem by Gil Vicente, and he then, it would seem, questions what makes a, what, where does the poetry in a poem lie? Is it, how does a poem announce itself? First, of course, through rhythms, as we have seen, but it also announces itself through lineation. So for this artist book, he simply takes the outline of stanzas and traces the outlines. So it's printed on vellum, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to see what's behind it if it wasn't printed on vellum. So you see the regular stanzas. Second variation is simply the outline of the stanzas. Third variation is these blocks of text that do not correspond to the original. Third variation 
a very beautiful, beautifully composed st stacking series of stanzas that again may or may not correspond to actual words in a poem. The fourth then presents an impossibility because how could you have a poem on top of another poem? But it cer certainly suggests that. The fifth one becomes a minimal poem and the sixth poem is the outline of the page, engulfing, engulfing really the original, which in my interpretation uh, underscores that really what makes poetry is the interpretive community in which the poem is circulating and opens the possibility of ex taking poetry off the page, expanding its borders and leading to space. Um, one thing that he talks about with Octavio Paz is the fact that he finds Spanish insufficient. One of the things he loves about being in Amsterdam is that poems do not need to exist in books. They can hang on walls and you don't need any particular language to write in. You don't need to master a language. I could quote that, but I won't. But if anyone's interested, I can give you some of the, some of the quotes later. And, um, and he, from, then, from that point on, refuses Spanish as his language. So in ending, I will just play you a very small clip of a piece that he recorded later in 1977. Uh, the sound piece appears uh, in a record called The Poet's Tongue. And ironically, uh, some of the pieces that actually use language, there's a lot of uh, numbers in these sonic pieces and the sound pieces, but one of the ones that uses language, or three of the ones that use language, are uh, lessons, Spanish lessons. So he's reflecting on his status in Amsterdam as a foreigner, troubling Spanish and his official language, the language that he's expected to be productive in, and also subverting the laws of Spanish by testing its channels. So um, this will just be the outro to my presentation. We can hear a little bit, I'll end, and then I'll pass on the microphone to the others. So how do I do this? Where's my, ah, yeah, yeah, it's que está aquí arriba. Ya ve, ahí. So the piece is called um, Español, Español. I'm happy to translate. Español, Español is, he's breaking up the word Español in two. Español, Español. Is it playing? There we go. Español, Español. Es Español. Es Español, sí, es Español. Es ese español, sí, ese es español. Es ese español, español, sí, ese español, es español. Es ese es español, español, sí, ese es español, es español. Es si es español, español, sí, si es español, es español. Es si es español, español, sí. Si es español, es español. Es si es español, no, si es no es español. Es ese no es español, español. Si ese no es español, es español. Es español es español. Si español es es español. Es es español es español. No es español es no es español. Es son españoles español. Sí, son españoles es español. The piece goes on for six minutes, <laughs> <laughs> and it's really fun. <laughs> okay, right. thank, thank you. you. Is this yours? Sorry. Uh, the one on the right. This one, right? All right. 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 
Okay. Um, well, thank you, Aime and Carolina, for the invitation. I'm very glad to um, dialogue um, on this um, incredible artist, um, a big influence, I, I, I think, for many artists and uh, authors in Latin America today. Um, so I will read a short text uh, focusing on mainly on um, other books and so, and ephemera magazine. Um, and I apologize for repeating a quote that uh, Monica has already um, uh, mentioned, but if I don't do it, I will lose track of my reading, I'm sorry. Um, Ulises Carrion makes part of a group of Latin American authors and artists uh, whose works during the 60s and 70s uh, questioned fundamental concepts of modern aesthetic code, such as writing, work, and authorship. For them, authorship will no longer be restricted to the production of texts within a book market. Instead, it will be understood as a practice in which all the activities involved in the book circuit are integrated. By, making charge of the, by taking charge of the edition, distribution, sale, conservation, curatorship, and archiving of books, magazines, and other bibliographic documents, they radically redefined what an author could do. Um, in this talk, I will explore how Carrion reflected on and developed alternative modes of circulation for his and others' works by focusing on, w on the ways he incorporated handcraft production, self-edition, and distribution in his own art, uh, art pieces, I would like to highlight how his works entail a shift from object to process and from book to publishing. Uh, one of the many embodiments of uh, Ulysses Carrion's efforts for establishing new networks of collaboration was Ephemera, a magazine he edited with his partner, Art van Barneveld and Salvador Flores between uh, 1977 and 1978. This uh, journal of male and ephemeral works, as one could read in the, um, all the covers, was produced in Our Books and So, a multifaceted space Carrion and his partner had founded in Amsterdam two years before. I believe it is necessary to take the role of other books and so into account and to consider both the space and the journal as two interfaces of the same publishing project. Um, in 1975, the same year other books and so opened, Carrion published The New Art of Making Books, a work that has been translated into at least seven languages and reprinted several times. Through af uh, aphorisms and mani manifesto-like propositions, the author questions modern conventions of the book as an, quote, accidental container of a text, end of quote. Um, so this, is, see, this would be the old art. And proposes instead uh, to regard it as a sequence in which uh, form contributes uh, as much to meaning as content. Carrion's change of perspective with regard to the book also entails redefinitions of the author and the act of reading. In his essay, Carrion asks for a concept of reading that transcends the linguistic realm and incorporates uh, the diversity of a book's interrelated elements. In taking its uh, materiality into account, Carrion says, Quote, the new art creates uh, specific reading conditions, end of quote. Accordingly, um, the author ceases to be understood solely as the producer of an object and assumes a role in its publication and distribution. Um, quote, in the new art, writing a text is only the first link in the chain going from the writer to the reader. In the new art, the writer assumes the responsibility for the whole process. Other Books and So uh, was inaugurated on April 15, uh, 1975. According to a Monoscope website, it is reputed to be the first bookstore dedicated specifically to artist publications. 
Um, other books and so was located um, on the basement level at uh, 227 a uh, Central Canal in Amsterdam. In this uh, low ceiling space, publication were, publications were displayed flat on a number of handmade tables and in open uh, cabinets. Um, as one journalist reported, in, um, reported it in RNRC Handelsblatt newspaper, quote, uh, on view are objects in all sorts and sizes, which at first sight, and to simplify matters, can all be referred to as books, yet there is not a single real book, end of quote. Carrion himself avoided the word bookstore before introducing a playful list of the shop's contents, other books are, and so advertising cards define it as, quote, a space for exhibition and distribution of other books, non-books, anti-books, pseudo-books, quasi-books, and so on. Um, in an interview recorded short after it closed in 1978, he stated other books and so had been founded by the need of, quote, a place for books, a place for exchanging artist books, end of quote. Carrion's view of other books and so as a place for exchange and distribution rather than trade underlies his and his partner's intention of creating a space through which to develop alternative communities and networks. The gallery shop, as he would later describe it, was in fact the result of a collaborative effort. Carrion and Van Barneveld asked 18 friends to each give 100 golden to pay for the first six months of rent. Qu I quote, um, in exchange for that, we would give them a diploma and we would give them <laughs> discounts, end of quote. Um, three weeks before the opening, Carrion sent more than a thousand letters to artists, writers, and editors, asking them to mail him their works. According to Gerrit Jan de Rock, an artist and art critic li living in Amsterdam at the time, um, quote, thanks to the broad scope of the collection in terms of origin, Eastern and Western Europe, Latin America, the United States, as well as techniques, stencil, offset, photocopy, letterpress, stamp, or handwritten, the gallery developed into the ultimate hangout for lovers of experiments with books." End of quote. Exhibitions and performances also took place in its room. Um, I'm not going to expand on that, um, but several of them uh, took place there. Ephemera, um, well, ephemera can be seen as another interface of Carrion's ongoing project of activating networks um, outside institutional frameworks. The journal emerged as a way of keeping the materials received by other books and so in motion. Um, the 12 numbers of ephemera follow the mail art principle of unselected publishing and hence cannot be wholly identified with the personal taste of Flores, Van Barneveld, or Carrion. Rather, uh, the monthly publica publication constitutes a reliable record of what was being mailed to other books and so at the time. <coughs> the contributions are reproduced in their original size and assembled as a collage in a tabloid-like format. Postcards, text, photographs, post stamps, collages, uh, rubber stamp impressions, and ephemera are scattered across the pages and tend to overlap with one another. This apparently unorganized style reinforces the anti-hierarchical spirit of the magazine. Moreover, most of the descriptions and addresses on the cover of the numbers, as well as the author and the year of each contribution are handwritten emphasizing the magazine's handmade nature. Um, the materials included in ephemera were sent from uh, Eastern and Western Europe, Latin America, United States, Canada, and Japan. The broad scope of the contributions highlights the magazine's translocal nature, a principle which is most apparent in the special issues and has been um, lucidly uh, underscored by Sana, who is here with us um, tonight in several articles. 
Um, it is worth mentioning a specific feature in um, in poetry as social environment, uh, ephemeras ninth uh, issue. <clears throat> a folded single sheet titled Relatos Urbanos, Sociedad de Anonima, uh, on its cover, showing six people disguised as vagabonds uh, on the central spread. This folio is the uh, tenth issue of Nervo Optico, a carta zete, um, which means small poster, published uh, by the homonymous artistic group in Porto Alegre between 1977 and 1978. Considering that Porto Alegre was at the time far from being a focal point for art in Brazil, a place traditionally occupied by Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, the inclusion of Nervo Optico uh, number 10 in Ephemeras 9 issue underscores the translocal nature of, of the magazine. According to Carrion, these new connections between outlying artistic groups and communities had important consequences for art. <clears throat> In an introduction to an exhibition curated by him, Carrion explores the relationship between book works and may works. If books as art objects offer the artist the possibility of expanding the distribution of their work, male art uh, strengthens uh, these tendencies. In his opinion, male art has at least two important and complementary consequences for artistic practice in general. The first one concerns the overcoming of spatial limits and the subsequent dismantling of the center periphery model. While the first consequence implies overcoming spatial limits, the second entails the dissolution of limits of the artist, art, artistic practice itself. Quote, where does the border lie, Carrion asks, between an artist's work and the actual organization and distribution of the work? When an artist is busy choosing a, a, his starting point, defining the limits of his scope, he has the right to include the organization and distribution of his works as an element of the same work. And by doing so, he is creating strategy that will become a constituent formal element of the final work." End of quote. Carrion argues that Maillard shifted the, fo the focus uh, from art to the wider concept of culture. By including uh, its organization and distribution as a constitutive element of the work, the artist opens uh, their scope to aspects that were considered to be out of the creative domain. In other words, Carrion uses the term culture to incorporate non-aesthetic elements into the artistic pra practice. It is interesting to note here that, from his point of view, Maillard questions authorship not only by assembling works from multiple contributors, but also by expanding the scope of the elements with which art worked. From Carrion's perspective, authorship does not rely on the production of artistic objects, but on the organization of cultural strategies, such as other books and so and ephemera. Um, according to Carrion, I quote, um, the utilization of various media, visuals, mail, sound, um, is not considered anymore to be the defining factor in their art activity, but is rather the coordination of a complex system of activities occurring in a social reality and including as well non-artistic factors, people, places, objects, time, etc. End of quote. Among these non-artistic uh, factors is uh, gossip. The seventh um, the seventh number of Ephemera, uh, published in May 1978, consists uh, entirely of a handwritten text by Ulysses Carrion. The text is displayed in two columns uh, together with high contrasted passport-like photos of un, uh, unidentified people. Throughout its uh, eight pages, the text describes mundane events from the artist's social circle. Um, I'm going to quote the, the first lines of the, of the cover. <clears throat> John Riggins uh, lives nearby. Art is my friend. Judith is probably coming soon to Amsterdam. Mick will have a show in A. 
Prina also, and John also. Raul has become a father. Marta has become a mother. Their daughter's name is Ramona. Franz and Barbara are somewhere in Italy or Switzerland. Gerard, is he in Strasbourg or in Paris? End of quote. And this is eight pages of uh, similar information. <laughs> um, just as artist magazines uh, such as Avalanche and File had done before, the seventh issue of Ephemera brings to the fore an artistic scene that at the time still was in process of formation. Carrion makes uh, use of gossip as a means to ac as accentuate the intimacy of the community around other books and so. The fact that people are referred only by their first names and more importantly, that gossip is handwritten, also contribute to generating this feeling of familiar familiarity. Handwriting, in fact, highlights the space's tendency to distance it itself from the impersonal character of traditional art institutions. But at the same time, it also underlines Carrion's authorship. <coughs> um, this is a uh, um, zoom to the last page of the of the, maga the this number of the magazine. Besides being signed uh, with his name, as you can see uh, there on the fourth, uh, no, where is it? Uh, somewhere there. I don't see it. Here's the year, monthly year. Whose name? Well, you found it. Yes. <laughs> ah, the first line. Yes, the first line. Uh, besides being signed with his name, uh, what we see throughout the publication is nothing other than the artist's own and personal writing. The issue stands at a paradoxical juncture, highlighting an emerging artist scene and at the same time its individual authorship. I understand this apparently contradictory, contradictory uh, situation as an embodiment of Carrion's shift from art objects to cultural strategies. At the time, other books and so had closed uh, as an open space and was about to become an archive. The artist was more emphatic regarding the dissolution of the artwork's uh, limits. Quote, you are someone who is not acting with your own name, but with, for instance, other books and so. You cease being a person, I mean an individual, who is doing a certain work only in his name. You become an institution a social body that works among other social bodies. You're not an artist, but you are a gallery, or you are as a gallery, or you are a bookshop, or a magazine, for instance. Carrion's statement that uh, publishing a magazine can be a work of art must be understood by putting the spotlight on publishing rather than on magazine. His concept of becoming social body stresses the idea that authorship relies more on the organization of cultur cultural strategies than on the creation of artistic objects. Carrion's signature on Ephemera 7 issue then suggests that he, as an artist, is the organizer of a social body comprising other books and so and Ephemera magazine. Carrion, in this sense, is not an author of Ephemera 7 issue, but of long-term publishing processes through which uh, new alternative networks and communities were created. Thank you. this working? Yeah. So um, i also like to thank Aime and America Society and ISLA um, for inviting me um, and also uh, to write in the, um, the pamphlet was that was created. 
Um, and also my fellow panelists for their uh, papers, which I'm also going to get into some related themes, uh, especially handwriting. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm glad that that's already been introduced. Um, so I'm actually going to talk um, about projects and, and mail out projects and try and put Gedeon's work. Um, and I for please forgive me that my rolling of R's is not amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to put Carillon's work in um, a bit of uh, context within the broader mail art network. Um, and so mail art sometimes looks like this, you know, just a pile of letters um, that's an interpersonal exchange. Um, but uh, projects, um, publications and exhibitions kind of made the network be able to be a network. Um, wait, let me time. Sorry, I want to keep track of my time. Um, and so they were able to, these kind of collective endeavors reflected the network back to itself, kind of created a mirror. Um, and so they were really important. And those uh, projects were usually exhibitions or publications or the project. Um, and this is Ulysses Gadion's table of uh, mail art works, which he wrote when he was writing a text um, exploring mail art, uh, mail art and the big monster that I may talked about. Um, and I'm really talking about item 2.2, which is the group work. Um, and it shows you also that Carillon was very invested in you know, lists um, and analyzing and really probing quite profoundly um, the principles of the network, um, of what it meant to be involved in the mail art network in a way that I feel um, not so many artists were kind of deeply invested in exploring um, as he was. Um, so I'm not going to look at any exhibitions or publications, but just the, the project. And to kind of outline what a project is, I wanted to give you a couple of other examples outside of what Cadillon has done. Um, and the first one is uh, Horacio Zabala's a pretty straightforward use of the network to um, collect responses to his um, concept that he worked for many years on, which was the idea that art was a prison and um, exploring this uh, notion of the physical space of the artwork as a prison, but also the kind of political um, context in which he was living in Argentina. Um, and uh, there were some also more ingenious projects like the portrait of Robin Crozier. Um, Robin Crozier was a British artist from Sunderland, so another kind of outpost, not from London or um, Edinburgh. And um, he, in this case, he invited artists to um, draw a portrait of him. So he was kind of invoking the spatial distance. Most of those people would never have met him um, and didn't know what he looked like. And so he invited people to send a portrait of him. And then he further mediated um, their responses by um, hand drawing their responses and then producing a book with it. So there was a few stages. So for me, that's one of the examples. This one was made in um, 1975 of like a more interesting um, use and thought, thinking through of this kind of call and response uh, project. So Carillon's work um, and his projects <laughs> tested and occasionally poked fun at the network's utopianism, its paradoxical reliance on the postal system <laughs> and its rules. So I'm sure some of you are familiar, but there was a sort of basic rule of engagement in mail art, which was um, that there should be no selection, no juries. Everybody who sends something um, should be able to participate. Um, and on, it's the gift exchange, money is not to change hands, and on and on. And some of uh, the people who participated in the network, most of the people kind of adhered to those rules, and some of the people took them very seriously and were extremely strict about it, and which led to certain kind of downfalls, I think, and um, in some ways, um, the, you know, what Garion points to is that um, people were sort of over-participating in a way, but it's kind of another story. <laughs> Um, and um, thank you, Monica, for introducing the um, earlier work, because for me, that early work, which is a sort of rigorous but very playful kind of systematic um, um, development of um, kind of s uh, a structural analysis of li uh, literary uh, work, um, 
it was sort of opened up. So he, he used a similar dynamic in his projects and like puts forth an idea and then, um, but it's an open system as, a po as opposed to a closed one. And I think many of the artists who are working um, in the male art network in the 70s were you know, very indebted to like information theory, um, systems theory, and thinking about you know, Umberto Eco's uh, The Open Work. And so this kind of move from a sort of systematic structure to an open structure in which um, others can participate and you sort of free the work and put it into play. Um, so now instead of him authoring these the sort of treatments that he gave to the poems in the earlier work, his concepts unleashed into a network, um, opening up into dialogical communication and field him, field, fielding Gerion much further, even further from this kind of literary model that he had been um, part of at the beginning of his career. Um, and so the first one, oh, we won't talk about that. So these are the, um, the projects um, in total, and I'm just gonna talk about three because of time. Um, and the first one I don't wanna spend too much time on because it's very straightforward and it was in fact dreamed up by someone else as it states at the end, the original idea for the show is by H.W. Kalkman. Uh, but so definitions of art was very straightforward um, in that he asked people to respond. Um, and this is an installation shot of the show as it was beautifully installed. Um, and there you get to see that Horacio, uh, Horacio Zabala's Art is a Prison, you know, is kind of recirculating. And uh, when you're a researcher in this field, you see these um, sort of tropes coming up again and again. Um, and I think uh, this work is really interesting for me, um, not because of the structure of the project, but there's a clue in um, his use of the postcard um, and the index card in his work. Um, the postcard kind of has its own specificity, like the telegram, it affects brief, efficient mm -hmm. communication of non-private matters. Um, although, um, and it's also, of course, um, used to convey images, but Carrion kind of studiously avoids um, using images for, um, to sort of maintain the specificity of the text-based aesthetic. Um, the, the postcard has been really used, um, interestingly analyzed recently by Monica Cure in a book called Picturing the Postcard. Um, and uh, she examines how it was kind of, um, in, uh, it was it, the anxieties around the introduction of the postcard um, in the late 19th century were all to do with um, the sort of contrast between the um, intimacy of the letter and um, the public nature of the postcard. And I think that's something that's really interesting to think about in um, <laughs> Kedion's work. But I want to move on to, oh, here's one, last one. Um, the erratic art male international system, um, or EMIS. Uh, so, EMIS uh, was a kind of parody, um, a mail art network that was independent of the postal system, in which correspondence, correspondence would be carried to its destination by traveling friends and acquaintances in a slow but deliberate trajectory, Carrion said, by any way other than the official post offices. The idea occurred to Carrion while writing the essay Mail Art and the Big Monster in 1977. One of the questions the text explored was the restriction of creative freedom when sending the works through the mail, which as a vehicle of the state was constricted by bureaucratic control and in some contexts, direct censorship. Carrion reflected, when producing the piece, we are free. What about the mailing? Then we are not free. We are subject to certain rules established beforehand. In the same text, the artist envisioned a mail art system not dependent on what he called the big monster, he said, let's imagine a piece of mail art that uses a substitute for the post system. For instance, we can give letters to a number of friends that set out in different directions. We can give these friends precise instructions regarding when and how and to whom our messages should be delivered. The EMIS principles, um, you can see on the right, probably not clearly at all, but there were eight um, principles of the system. Um, it guaranteed three delivery, free delivery within three years. Otherwise, the item would be returned to its sender by EMIS. Um, it asked that the EMIS archive receive a duplicate for the purposes of record keeping. 
uh, ensured the pa that packages of any size, destination, or origin could be sent through the system and protected against fakes and falsifiers through verifications by EMIS stamps and seals. The final point on the list stated, by using the EMIS, you support the only alternative to the national bureaucracies and you strengthen the international artist community. Carrion had thus deciphered one of the fu fundamental contradictions of the mail art network. Its alternative model for exchanging art was deeply dependent on the state. His erratic art mail international system playfully proposed to replace the postal service with an inefficient but independent alternative. Carrion's emis traced bodies moving across space, bodies that in their inefficiency would proclaim their desystematized, unbureaucratic qualities. Emis exaggerated these inefficiencies precisely to reveal the gap between human-oriented conversation, participation, and networking, and the smoothly patterned systems of the late modernisms and to humanism. He replaced the system with a purposefully erratic one then that defined itself implicitly as non-functioning by the standards of everyday systems of modern life. By creating a system based on the uneven and capricious wanderings of an internationally mobile art crowd, one that by today's standards was even less in constant efficient movement, Carrion placed in high relief the question of systems that, that was at the heart of conceptual interventions. I think it's kind of interesting to think about what an EMIS would look like now that we are moving around so much. It would probably be much better, <laughs> uh, much better. Uh, Carrion's concern with delineating effective networks um, is also revealed by issue number seven of the magazine Ephemera, which you've already seen. Uh, this is something sent by Emis, where you can see the stamp. Um, and as I, I wanted to draw attention, I'm trying to draw attention to the sort of somatic principles in um, Carrion's work. Um, and I, I will get to this handwritten and typed uh, again. But so um, ephemera, which has already been described, uh, was a handwritten log of superfluous um, and painstaking um, information. Carrion's cursive is excessive in its performance of the local and communal aspects of his world, making the text barely communicate. However, like many of the artist projects, it directs us back to his social world, the comings and goings of friends, to signify a point about communication and the construction of what he denominated personal worlds and cultural strategies. That it is handwritten is, of course, not incidental, and Carrion's push and pull between paper's rigid systems and somatic traces is visible in several other projects, such as the index cards where individuals are asked to choose between a handwritten and a typed love letter. The translation from somatic cursive to type text was also present in the project uh, Anonymous Quotations of 1979, exhibited at the publisher Void Distribution in March that year. And I actually hadn't thought very much about this piece until um, I saw it in uh, the exhibition. Um, and it really uh, called my attention. It's, it's still a bit of a puzzle to me that I'm, I'm trying to unravel. Um, it's uh, anonymous quotations takes chosen passages from Carrion's copious mail art correspondence, mediating and formalizing them in typed text. Like his other projects executed through the mail art network, this piece visualizes the structure of the web of interactions that sustain it. Each typed quotation is presented with a black and white photograph of the letter from which it is sourced and with the name of the sender redacted. The quotation itself is typed in red on ruled paper. Carrion transfers from personal missive to a selected quotation, made anonymous by transferring the words from personal writing to impersonal type text. Each of the passages selected speaks of highly personal aspects of the sender's life, their immediate surroundings. Um, so one letter says he, uh, is describing the place where they're living. And I think this might be Takako Saito. So it's also a bit of a puzzle and a game trying to figure out um, who the author is, especially since many of the people who would be um, seeing this exhibition would probably be participants in the network. Um, the letter reads, here I have two rooms, a kitchen and a bedroom. I live alone. 
The kitchen is quite big, about the same size of the kitchen in Langford Court. So I think this is Takako Saito because she was resident in the Boges Press at Langford Court um, as well as Ulysses. I wish I had an extra blanket or a mattress. I wish I could do something that you could stay here for a night or two. Others detail psychological struggles amidst political censorship. You know better than I the situation here, owing to the control of information. The air is heavy. One almost can't breathe. My place is here. And this is from Clementi Padin. It's very clear. Um, and he's alluding to the fact that you know, they um, likely Carrion has more information about the situation in Uruguay, where he's writing from. Perhaps um, the quotations in the latter case is anonymous because of a certain danger implicit in exhibiting such communication. Looking again at the photographs, one notices that each of the letters is photographed in a pile of correspondence. The relevant one is on top, but the image speaks of a persistent interest of Carrion's, the archive. Carrion's quotations are pulled out of the plethora and flux of information, out of the archive, and systematized, raised to the level of attention, transcription, and inducted into, into culture in the form of an exhibition. The reader may strain to read the rest of the letter, but the photograph is produced at just the size that makes it difficult to read. The reader thus becomes a viewer. The text is reproduced uh, at just the right amount to take in in one visual gulp. On occasion, the viewer may be able to decipher a name or put clues together to figure out who the sender is. So it also seems to be a game or puzzle of some sort. Carrion draws attention to the modes by which the written epistolary letter can become culture as quotation, as art, as exhibition. The majority of mail art projects are of an assembled and unedited status with editorial roles often being as compiler rather than editor. In anonymous quotations, Carrion, however, takes the unusual step of selecting from and editing his correspondence. There's more letters. So you can see they're all subject to the same treatment. And it's very formal. And I think that's something that's interesting about Carrion, how he kind of walks this tightrope between the formal and the anti-formal practice of male art. And here he is in the performance, The Paper Eaters. Um, Gadion's works follow a kind of um, model of authorship where the conceptual parameters open out into interdialogic or polyphonic communication. The procedure's parameters, usually in conceptual art, enacted in constrained anti-humanist fashion, are sent out to play. The polyphonic has much to do with Gadion's and more broadly male art's conception of authorship as one that moves from the monologic, signifying authorial intent, to the polyphonic as conceptualized by Bakhtin. That Bakhtin was developing his theory of the polyphonic from a literary perspective, with examples from Dickens, among others, seems all the more relevant in the context of Carrion's literary background. I also wanted to think about the broader implications um, of Carrion's practice and male art's transgressive practice more generally. Trans transgressive because it denies and transcends categories, be those artistic or geographical, or pertaining to race, gender, and sexuality. Queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz called these tendencies anti-disciplinary protocols in an exploration of the anti-formalist work of Ray Johnson. Writing about Johnson's male art, Munoz wrote of a performative art that moved. This is me quoting him. Performing objects insofar as they danced along the runways and stages provided by the world postal system. And uh, here... Um, Ulysses Carrion's um, essay on correspondence art picks up on uh, Ray Johnson's uh, use of dance in correspondence um, instead of the E. He replaces it with an A to suggest this kind of performative practice. Munoz wrote, uh, there were performative object, they were performative objects that flowed like queer mercury through the channels of majoritarian communication and information. Indeed, Ulysses, oh sorry, and we can see Carrion's inaction of the antidisciplinary in his new systems of knowing and organizing in the spontaneous and anti-formalist approach he took to his male art projects. Um, the male art mode of authorship was distributed. Um, and I just wanted to finish with this slide where um, 
with two works, one of which um, is Ray Johnson on the left, um, a piece that's pretty well known, but um, you can see that it's um, designed to be, um, his image um, as author is designed to be kind of cut out and um, into little pieces. And there are address names and addresses of people on each of those little pieces so that his authorship would literally be distributed through the network. And I think authorship is something that we could certainly talk about more in the discussion. And on the right is um, a drawing by Unhande Jara Lisboa, who is a um, Brazilian artist from um, Joa Pessoa in the northeast of Brazil, and uh, who actually died just a, a few weeks ago. Um, but I really like to um, use this image to think about the sort of reconfiguration of, um, uh, of geographical space, of center-periphery concepts um, in male art. Um, and that's something also that Felipe brought up um, as a way of thinking about male art the way that it transgresses many of these different categories and modes of production. Thank you. Thank you very much to <coughs> everybody. Um, before we open the questions to the audience, I wanted to make a question to, in a way, all of you. Uh, and maybe we can start with Monica because she brought it up, but you, your final comment, in a way, brings it up also. You know, and I was thinking um, about the internationalist aspect of male art uh, uh, with regards to Carrion, but maybe also with regards to other artists, and you can probably expand on that, Sana. And, you know, there's something internationalist in male art as a system. There's something internationalist in the 1970s, in a way, probably the end of the internationalist utopia of the 1960s, of the developmentalism. And there's something international in Carrion's like personal, like life uh, biographical move, um, and also in the way in which he works, you know, about uh, the materiality of language more than about uh, the meaning of language itself uh, that allows him to have a more international practice. I wonder which one came first, his interest on that, on the fact that he was doing an international career in art and literature. Um, and I w also wanted to, you know, push that a little bit and ask all of you, what is local about Carrion? What is Mexican, especially to you as a mm -hmm. Mexican person? What is Mexican about Carrion? <laughs> I mean, it's hard, it's hard to answer the question and not fall back on some cliches, perhaps, or essentialist, yeah, essentialist cliches. I would say that something that's very, that, that I recognize as Mexican, maybe other people do not, but um, the sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Especially in the sound pieces, um, there are there's one in particular in which he's using a version of Pig Latin, where he's talking about if you if you want to travel to South America, you need to learn Spanish, and if to, and to learn Spanish, and but before you do so, you need to make sure that you have your paperwork in order, and you have a paper, and you have your passport, etc. But he's using like. I can give you a little demonstration. He'll say like, "Sipi que perepes y pirapa." Supudapa me peripicapa, tepe nepes quepe, copon prapartepe, upun lipi propo, depe epes papañopol. He doesn't say that, I'm quoting him. So I find, I find that. <laughs> um, that. That seems Mexican to me. Yeah. Um, but other than that. Well, I mean, I, I mean, he not much. He notoriously distanced himself from his family and, mm -hmm. um, you know, created a, a new. Um, situation for himself in Amsterdam and that kind of um, there's a, a couple of publications where um, uh, a lot of his friends and family are sort of recalling um, this relationship that he had or, or didn't have with Mexico and um, I think it's to do with you know his um, gay identity and wanting to establish himself in a new place what, that was internationalist and also removing himself from um, uh, from his former career, you know, where he was a recognized young, bright author, and um, there were expectations of him to continue in that path. And um, I think it's very interesting when you think of it from that perspective that he sort of removed himself from those expectations and then, like, created something completely different. Um, 
I just had well, just before you, Felipe. Um, one, there's one piece called Lidia Prado Superstar mm-hmm. that some of you might know. So that one, that one is, seems very emblematic of that removal, where he takes this Mexican m- movie star who is a local movie star. Nobody knew her internationally, but she, but he created this, fa- this fake uh, film festival all about Lidia Prado's films. And uh, the piece was really more about building the hype around the festival than the festival itself. Um, so there's this, the taking of the trope that would be national and then the removal of everything around it that leaves it just like an empty signifier, right? That could well, um, yeah. I was actually thinking about that piece mm-hmm. when I made the question. Uh, and do you think it's really a removal? Because at the same time, it's a, an artist who migrated, who a long time after migrating is taking a completely like kishi figure from his childhood probably, mm-hmm. and bringing it back. And like I think also like like it's almost like a re- like reivindication, you know, like 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 mm-hmm. like bringing it back into. I mean, yes, there is kish, there is irony, but at the same time, uh, there's irony and and power in everything that he does. You know, I wonder to which degree, I mean, that nostalgia is necessarily a removal or at the same time a going back and a reconciling with his origin Mm -hmm. and in a way with the most trashy part of his origin, if you want to say, because of the very pop aspect. I mean, he's not, I mean, he's also in contact with Octavio Paz, which is certainly like the bourgeoisie Mm -hmm. of uh, Mexican culture, but... um, Right, but that was, yeah, yeah he, his contact with Baz, I think, before. ends right right mm. after he relocated, right before he opens other books and so. Okay. Um, and then it, it's, it's mysterious why those poems that he was in correspondence about never were actually published mm. in Mexico. So there's this correspondence, all these letters um, that, are, that are really fascinating documents, but then nothing happens with the poems uh, in Mexico. So I don't know. I mean, I think I think every I, I agree with what you're saying, but at the same time, so there's like um, there's a resistance to it. there's a push and pull. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, yes, he's mobilizing and activating that nostalgia, those those kitsch poppy tropes, but then at the same time, the you know the, he doesn't deliver the film festival. But it's that's more also, about that project's also about mm-hmm. um, you know cultural translation and cultural. Yes. Um, uh, colonialism. So mm-hmm. he's kind of exploring, you know, why is Marilyn Monroe, right. you know, perfectly well known in Mexico, mm-hmm. but and trying to sort of do a reversal mm-hmm. of um, how well known Marilyn Monroe would be or Bridget Bardot or something in mm-hmm. um, in Mexico. Whereas um, he's he's basically trying to infiltrate like Dutch culture mm-hmm. with this Mexican superstar that nobody um, in Holland would know about. And so he's he's. I, I mean, I see it kind of related to his male art practice in a way, because it's about sort of um, this mm. transcending um, geographical kind of categorizations and the center periphery models that are explored through, you know, the internationalism of or translocalism of, of the male art network. Mm. Um, well, yeah, that's a, that's a question that always uh, comes to mind while. Um, facing uh, Carino's work, uh, what is Mexican about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would just say that um, I think it's, he's, he makes part of, or, or what is Latin American is about uh, Carino's work is maybe this feeling of insufficiency that um, uh, several Latin American artists felt and made them uh, go abroad and work abroad. Um, not only Mexican artists, but also Colombian and uh, South American in general, um, even before the dictatorships. Um, and those artists are um, very present in Ephemera's uh, uh, magazine and also uh, in the in the in the um, uh, exhibitions he organized in the in other books and so. So he kind of connects with. It's true that he connects with people from all around the world, but he's also part of a sort of uh, um, diaspora Latin American uh, presence in in, in Europe. Um, I would also say that it would be interesting to explore more the relationship between Carrión and um, uh, uh, 
el Centro de Arte y Comunicación en, en Buenos Aires. Um, I know he went there, he uh, gave a talk there, and uh, so there's also this, they were reading Carrion's work uh, while he was in Holland. They were, they were um, somehow knew about his work in, in Buenos Aires, so there's also a connection. And, and finally, I, I can only say that uh, also we should um, take consideration of his reception now nowadays in Latin America. Um, he's becoming more and more uh, present in, uh, I think, in, in, in interviews of uh, Latin American authors, Latin American artists, and uh, even um, uh, publishing presses, uh, small presses that are reprint reprinting uh, his books. And uh, so there's also a Latin American or Mexican reception now. I have a question. Can I? Uh, apropos of this, um, I'm very interested in that show that I mentioned, the In and Out of Amsterdam. That, that was a MoMA. Um, it didn't include any Latin American artists. If I co if I remember correctly, no Latin American artists were in it. And um, but a lot of West Coast conceptualists were in that show. So Al Rupersberg was in it. Um, Stanley Brown. I don't remember who the Bastianata, others were. Maybe? Pardon me. May maybe, I don't remember. But no Latin Americans, um, even though the claim in the catalog was that the In-N-Out Center founded by Raul Marroquin, who was Colombian, was, mm -hmm. was a very important meeting point. So I'm, I'm just curious, maybe for, for you, Sana or, and, and Aime, why do you think that even though all those artists were there in Amsterdam at the same time, was there, and maybe they all actually did have work and other works and so, what was, why didn't someone say like, Al Rupersberg know of Ulises Carrion? Mm. Or what, maybe was Baldessari there also? I, yes, Baldessari. Like why, why is there no connection between them, even though they're there at the same time? I don't know the answer to it. Mm. So maybe that is where actually there, there's an internationalism that doesn't really translate into the actual networks of people and their common practices of just hanging out, going to the bookstore. Maybe, maybe there is a line there that goes across, that doesn't cross nationalities or the language. I don't know. Well, I mean, the reason why I made the question in the first mm -hmm. place is, um, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about that show specifically because mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. To be completely honest. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I work a lot about international networks of uh, migrant artists in New York in the 60s and 70s in my own research, and uh, something that I found is that um, they were part of networks uh, in which they had a very prominent place, uh, but then our history doesn't show that place, you know? The translation in between the real practices, I mean, I'm, I, when I talk with uh, local New York artists uh, that were part of the Fluxus movements, everybody knows about Jaime Davidovich, for example, right? Everybody knows about him, everybody worked with him, uh, people have no doubt who he was. Um, but then he wasn't recognized by either uh, mainstream, like historiography of fluxus until recently, neither by Latin American art history until a little bit less recently, but still recently. So you have this like, like you know, the difference in between the real practices of artists, which are like more naturally internationalist and I think more democratic and also have to do with social circles. Mm -hmm. And social circles, I, I feel like are less, you know, yeah, I think uh, we literally yeah. know that there was like a systematic, maybe unintentional erasure of artists. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly that happened to women artists, you know, that of were course. present, uh, mm -hmm. very present, and then just not recorded in art history. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I think it's, it's a similar mm -hmm. thing. So maybe they did know each other, you know, and there's also this kind of... Um, you know, blind spot almost where the, um, you know, influence couldn't travel in that direction. It could mm -hmm. only be going one way. Right. And so right. yeah. that, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think, should we, audience? Yes, audience. I, I have a, a follow-up question for Monica or maybe a, an elaboration of IMS question. Um, we could think of uh, Carrion's work as a general anti-authoritarian machine, 
And if we think about literary circles in Latin America and elsewhere, there is always a central authority. Borges in Argentina, André Breton for the Surrealists in France, certainly Octavio Paz for Mexico. If there is something about Mexican humor and an attack, an assault on the ability of language to mean that belongs not to the high culture in Mexico but to low culture is the culture of albures, albur, the Mexican albur, mm -hmm. where, uh, and I'm going to leave to your answer to explain to the audience <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh, exactly what the Alburas are, but in, in, in when the Mexicans in particular and people from Hidalgo more in particular speak in Alburas, uh, two or more people say something that others cannot understand. Language apparently means something, but it's meaning something even opposite and also oftentimes dirty. So the question is, do you see any connection be between that culture and Carrion's humor? Or can you elaborate on that as a distinctively Mexican assault on language? Mm -hmm. well, absolutely. I mean, and, and that, that would be maybe an anti-colonialist gesture. Um, I wouldn't say that Carrion was at all interested in positing a, say, a critique that would um, go in the direction of indigeneity, right, at all. But in his treatment of those canonical Spanish poems, they're clearly canonical Spanish poems, and that seems to be part of the gesture as well. Like a different, like a, an, an assault on it because of their status. He doesn't pick Mexican poems. He doesn't pick contemporary poems. He he, tend, he picks golden age Spanish poems that everybody actually has to learn in school, right? So it has to do with a letter tradition and and a post colonial take on them. Um, so yes, I think that assault is 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 very um, prominent in the poems and also in the sound pieces, but what I see in the sound pieces that's really interesting is that that piece is, is Español, Español. Uh, I don't see any albur, and albur would be a pun, right? Like a dirty pun. I don't see albur is there, but I do see that it's working both ways. On the one hand, it's, it, it's really defacing, it's making Spanish almost unrecognizable, right? To someone who doesn't understand it. It is really like, vandalizing Spanish on the one hand. At the same time, it implicates the listener because as we are listening, we are going along with the testing of the channels ourselves. So we are, if you understand Spanish, then you are both implicated in the, dis, in the destruction and defacing and the vandalization of Spanish and also in, its, in testing its communicability, which seems key to what he's doing with other networks as well. He's providing alternative networks that, that test the resilience of the network. So in that sense, I feel like the resilience of the Spanish language community is tested and creates a, a receivership that excludes those who don't understand, which is, is, is an interesting conundrum for me. But, but yeah, the, the albures, I see a tendency maybe, but there's no punning in his work that I've, that I've, that I've encountered in the writing, especially in the poems. It's not dirty. It's actually, it's, it's elegant. It pushes it, but never goes there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. This, um, I was involved with this world mm. at this time and knew Ulysses a bit, ah. you know. Wow. And so it's just so two things, and then I wanted to hear what you had to say. The first is that it was fairly typical of correspondence art, mail art projects in the States that what you received when you sent your work was it would be shown, there would be no jury, you know, which you mentioned, but also you would be provided with a mailing list so that the network could continue, and that was a very big part of it. And that raises a question I have about this idea about how mail system works. When when the, the last time we saw Ulysses in Amsterdam, remember him taking us around and talking about how people in Amsterdam, culture in Amsterdam, people were squatting in apartments. He, the, was, squatting. he was squatting. As I recall. And so, that, so he was living in Amsterdam in a very open society. You know? And my memory was with Mal, other Malai projects I was involved in that worked, for instance, that came from Eastern Europe if we put out a call for something, they didn't have another way to get the work into circulation. That wasn't that the mail system was bureaucratic. It was fascist. So they used 
that system to get their work into any kind of circulation. And then you have at the other end the Samizdat, you know, in the Soviet Union, which was closer to what, you know, he was doing with that system. Yeah. So anyway, I just that that idea about how things he's so, so was so invested in circulation of all different kinds in so many wonderful ways. So I just just wanted to hear more about that idea of how things move around and what it means when they come from one environment like you know, like Eastern Europe, you know, or Argentina or the States and Great Britain. In other words, the stuff is in circulation, but it means different things that it is. So, thank you again. Well, that's kind of like the perennial <laughs> problem of mail art in a way, as I'm sure you know. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in this question of how things travel and translate across different contexts and how artists um, also thought about that and sort of premeditated ways in which they would uh, you know, try to communicate. And also I'm, I'm interested in miscommunication, which is not so much talked about, but um, you know, there was a lot of, um, well, perhaps you, you might remember um, some of these moments yourself, but for example, um, you know, pro-Cuban artists in Latin America sending, um, you know, uh, pro-Cuba uh, slogans and Marxist slogans to um, artists in the GDR, for example, like didn't go down very well. Um, <laughs> because, you know, the language of, um, you know, of liberation on um, one side of the mailing was, you know, the language of the, the state Depression. and the institution on the, on the other side. Um, and I think that's just, you know, the, that's the nature of communication and also of use of different um, languages to communicate and the necessity for using English um, much of the time, which results in a sort of broken communication. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of the problem, which I, I find very Which I productive. think at the same time is the, more, the, the, the richest part of it. I mean, I think the fantastic thing about uh, male art, I mean, is that when I was talking about like how it's like a, in a way the peak of internationalism is precisely because it also shows the limits of internationalism in the example mm -hmm. you just gave, mm -hmm. you know, so it takes it to the limit of possibilities. And at the same time, you know, it shows, you know, the, impo the, the impossibility of a total globalization, you know, and this like utopia mm -hmm. that in a way is still alive in culture in many regards, you know, this idea of, which doesn't mean that we have to go local. On the contrary, it means, but it means you know to accept noise as part of the communication and to accept you know mm -hmm. uh, the interest, the non-translatability of third and cultural phenomena. Or mm -hmm. I remember reading an, an interview with Ruth uh, Wolf Rehfeld, who's this amazing um, concrete poet um, from East Germany, and. Um, she had received a mailing from a British um, artist called Pauline Smith, who started the Adolf Hitler fan club, uh, which was, you know, I mean, extremely satirical. And, um, you know, Ruth was like, I, I couldn't um, deal with that. You know, that just, I just couldn't even receive. So there was this sense to which you could receive, you know, anything, but you weren't necessarily receiving it, you know, you, you weren't necessarily going to accept what you're receiving. There was a lot of porn, you know, circulating as well. And um, some people were on board with that and other people weren't, you know, there's, um, you know, there's so many kind of dynamics to it, but it's, I think it's, you know, thinking about it as just kind of human, it, mm -hmm. it helps us to understand that. Yeah, I, I would just uh, like to add that, um, as you said, it was, uh, what is interesting of Mailer is that, uh, well, one of the many things that I find interesting is that uh, it becomes something very close to life. It's vital. And even for some of them were, as you mentioned, uh, uh, practice of uh, survival. Um, I'm currently researching on uh, a Chilean artist, uh, named uh, Guillermo Deisler. And uh, he's, he's a good example of uh, what uh, Mailer could do for an artist or for, for a person. Uh, he, he, he was um, 
uh, engaged with the Communist Party in Chile, and then, of course, exiled after the coup in 73. And the thing is that um, he was exiled, and he came to France, and then to East Germany, but there was a sort of quota system, and so he was sent to Bulgaria. And um, I cannot imagine how harsh uh, is uh, to be sent to Bulgaria in the 70s, leaving all your family behind and not knowing at all the language. So for he said uh, in an interview years after that uh, Maillard became a, a practice of survival, actually, because it was the only way he could communicate with the world he had left behind him. Um, and also because, as, as uh, people mentioned, uh, I mean, it was mentioned here, uh, you can go beyond uh, the limits of language. Um, he didn't even know how to buy bread when he arrived to Bulgaria, but he could participate in mail art uh, networks. So, um, yeah. Any other question? I'm going to take one more question. Anyway, I'll just, yeah. I'll just add to that that, again, the, the economic context had a lot to do with the kind of circulation. And here, because there was an art market, which did not exist in a lot of other places, you know, part of the impulse, I think, for many artists who participated was to get, both get around the system by eliminating juries and so forth, but <coughs> Behind that, there could be a lot of bitterness because you may have wanted to get around the Museum of Modern Art, but you may have also wanted them to love you <laughs> and pay you for what you did. And I certainly was at events and panels where there were enormous fights about these things. You know, so it's different, but that was very, very particular, I think, to he for here mm -hmm. and would be very different in Amsterdam and so on yeah. and other places. <clears throat> As you pointed to, you know, I think he, here in the U.S. is kind of perhaps more of a sort of dropping out kind of quality to um, participating in the mail art network. And then, like, I don't know if you think about um, Brazil or Argentina, it was more like the public sphere was so sort of severely compromised by um, the dictatorships that it, you know, it was kind of one of the obvious options for like finding an audience or being able to practice how you wanted to practice and be in touch with um, people internationally. Um, so yeah, completely. Well, thank you very much. Please uh, join me in thanking our speakers again. That was a great talk. Um, Thank you very much for coming, and I hope to see everybody in our next program. Thank you very much. <laughs>